Welcome here to one of our last panels of this wonderful conference. My name is Christoph Mücher. I work as a director of the Goethe Institute in Boston. I arrived in Boston one year ago and before worked in New Zealand, lived like all the New Zealanders in a rather large house. From New Zealand, I moved to Munich, and since Munich is so incredibly expensive, I moved to a very small apartment, and now Boston is even more expensive, so I'm paying $5,000 for a ridiculously small apartment, which means that my pool table I bought in New Zealand, my little Volkswagen, 50 years of age, three other big tables I use to entertain guests are in different storage places around the world, one in Munich, two in Boston, and actually I hate myself for paying so much money every month for stuff I don't need at all. And I reckon this sad situation must have been the reason for my colleagues to inviting me to host this panel on owning in the 21st century. So it's a matter if sharing might be the new owning in our days. And I'm very happy to having two wonderful experts on these subjects, two very different people, although they wear the same color. We have from Slovenia on my right, Micha Mazzini, who is, first of all, an author, just finished the 30th book, translated into 10 languages, achieved many prizes, he is also a scriptwriter for award-winning prizes. And just before this meeting, he told me he hasn't got a clue why he's sitting here. And I'm telling you now why you're sitting here. Because you have a PhD in, I have to read that, the anthropology of everyday life. So Micha will tell us about everyday life, the importance of ownership and sharing. And maybe one last interesting insight on his website. You can read that recently at the Simons Sigmund Freud House, he acquired, quotation, one mind, 19 euro, and one brain, 26 euro. So we promise you we're going to challenge your mind and your brain you just acquired in this session. On my left, Wolfgang Sützel. Wolfgang Sützel is philosopher. He is media theorist, and he is, first of all, a teaching nomad. He is traveling the world with probably one suitcase and has been teaching in different places like Austria and Greece and Spain and Mexico and Costa Rica, and I probably forgot half of it, and is currently teaching at the University of Ohio at the School of Media Arts and Studies. And one of his many specialities is actually sharing in the digital fields. So we have a real expert on digital sharing here. And just my last sentence, I already checked his website as well. And there you can read, you won't find me on Facebook. Why not? Um, I should oh, use my own. Yes, my own. I to share that with you. Um, Hello, everybody, and um, thanks for the introduction. Um, why am I not on Facebook? Um, the short answer is I don't want my um, data and my information and my behaviors. Um, my preference is my emotions, my inclinations, um, to be the basis of a business model. And I don't, I have that choice not to be on Facebook, and therefore I'm not on Facebook. Good. I have a tricky question for you too, Micha. What's your, what's your most treasured and valuable possession? Uh, hmm. that, that really is a tricky question. Uh, but uh, once... Uh, uh, okay, but it's an easy answer, actually. Once... Uh, <laughs> Uh, I was looking through the window and I was wondering why it's so foggy. And then re I realized that uh, uh, my apartment is burning. Okay? <laughs> so actually, uh, I ran into the fire and saved the children first. And then I returned uh, and saved my notebook and my backups <laughs> on the disk. And then uh, I returned in the fire for the, for the, um, 
the how do you call it in English that gas tank, you know, because I didn't want uh, to kill somebody in upper floors or lower floors. Very That's kind it. Of you. Maybe the same small question, stupid question to you as well. I'd, I told our public that you're traveling a lot, so I reckon you're traveling with not much possessions. But what's the very thing you always take with you when you're traveling? Um, I have two different answers to that question. What, to understand it, you need to know that I have also emigrated to America and I have given up all of the storage, storage boxes. I have actually reduced all of my possessions to one single suitcase. Mm -hmm. um, and that suitcase contained, in fact, an object I was not willing to, get, to give up. And it's a little wooden box um, that has survived from my parents' grocery store. My parents ran a grocery store in the country, small town. Uh, 1930s, beautifully made box, handmade box. That's, that's just the box, the type of box that in the 1930s was used to deliver things before the age of plastic and so on. Um, and, and that's something I will probably keep carrying with me. Great, thank you. Well, very different, a computer and a wooden box. Um, we asked our guests to give you a five-minute presentation on something that's very important for them, relating to our subject. And as a neutral moderator, we start with the alphabet, and M comes before S. So I would like to ask Micha to give us a presentation. And after five minutes, I'm getting very grumpy, Micha. So okay, uh, I want music microphone. You will realize why after. So actually, I was thinking about the, uh, uh, the material things in 21st century, you know. So, uh, all I have to say is actually we will start with the music, you know, with the transportation media for the music. And uh, um, so, this is the gramophone record, okay? And I, I can't do it, I'm so okay, sorry. So the translation. Can, you, can you hold it here yes. for me? Okay, yeah, of course. <laughs> so this is the gramophone record. Uh, this is CD, okay? And this is uh, my uh, download codes for, I don't know, whatever you want here. Okay, that's basically all I have to say about, the pro <laughs> about this uh, thing. But I will have to explain slowly. Now, uh, now, for instance, uh, you know uh, a person who's a big, big fan of the Beatles. You have today two choices. You buy them the Beatles, Beatles uh, uh, box on gramophone records, and you bring him to him as a gift. So he's uh, receiving the gift like this, and the box is big, big. It was very expensive, but it's very big. He has a birthday or something, let's pretend he has a birthday, and he's receiving the gift, <gasps> and he's so, so very happy. Or you can buy digital download code, and you are presenting him with, for the same money, actually, you are presenting him with digital download code. So, he's receiving the di digital download codes, he checks the sum you paid for it, he's happy, actually. But there's a difference. And the difference is, difference is that by the statistics that are a few months old, the people who are, I don't know, paying Spotify or digital music are buying gramophone records more and more and more. Sales of gramophone records are going up, up, and up. And 60% of those records are never played. They are left in the plastic. Why? There's something strange going on. So, I want to tell you about this. But first, uh, okay, that was this. Then, uh, have you ever seen that graphic representation of sensory input coming to our bodies? It's called the human, uh, mm, sensory human color something, human color, some, uh, whatever. Don't translate this, it doesn't matter. It's just the representation uh, uh, where are our doors to the outer world. So the biggest 
probably is the face because we have our eyes here and we have our mouths, big, mouths are big because we taste, we kiss, we do everything with our mouths, a lot. And then, and almost equal or even bigger are the hands. Hands. And not just palms are the biggest. Then it's the thumb and the inner side of the fingers. Okay, why? Let's go back millions and millions of years. And uh, when our ancestors uh, were animals and living on the trees. Okay, when you're living on the tree, you basically have just two states. It's very binary <laughs> being. There's a branch and you jump. And there are just two possibilities. You either catch a branch or you fail. And you're dead. And that's why our brains, a large parts of brains are wired to our palms. You either catch a branch or you, or you missed it. So to catch a branch, to have palms full is success. To have palms empty is failure. And this is in the language. They left me empty-handed. I returned empty-handed. And this is really, really strange. Uh, because <laughs> uh, there are some, I forgot the name. Uh, there are some uh, nerves that are responding to this tapping, slow, slow tapping, like this. And we don't have them on our palms. Because when you're jumping on the branch, if you're slow tapping the branch, you're dead. Okay, you either grab it or you're dead. But we have them here, here. Because when you jump on the branch, if you caught it, the leaves will do this. And if you want to congratulate somebody, you did good job, you say. You did a good job. Why, how do we know that here are his nerves? for the slowly tapping that feel good. He had just caught a branch. Good job, thank you for calling it. Very good job so, indeed. <laughs> no, 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 I, can I continue a little bit? Five minutes gone, I'm afraid. I'm so sorry. Can, can I make the connection why I'm telling about this? So, uh, what is the modernity? What is the progress? The progress for the, la for the last hundreds of years and is getting faster and faster the progress means moving things from our palms, where our nerves are, toward the tips of our fingers. Our work is now based on the tips of our fingers. So large areas of our brain doesn't get information at all. And if the brain is without information, it hallucinates. If the people are in the dungeon and solitary in prison, they hear voices, they see pictures, they see... They hallucinate. So our brains are hallucinating because they don't have this sensor input. These are the biggest doors. And we are not using them anymore. And, uh, okay, you say, it, that was about music. Uh, because how do you hold a gramophone record? How do you hold the CD? Or how do you hold something digital? So if you have to give a gift, let them hold something. Okay, but just about the money. Because, uh, do you remember uh, that uh, Donald Duck has this, uh, this uncle Scrooge McDuck, it's uh, uncle uh, Dagobert. Dagobert. Uh, take a look, a picture of the Wikipedia. On Wikipedia, he's holding the walking stick and gold. Have you noticed that the walking sticks have gone out of the fashion the same time as the gold standard? And they are trying not to have the money anymore, but just credit cards. So how do you hold the credit card? You hold it like a CD with tips of your fingers. And, uh, uh, and let's just finish with this. Uh, the poor, poor uh, millionaires or billionaires, they have nothing to hold to. And you have the virtual billions on Cayman Islands, and you can't wallow in the gold anymore. I mean, even food. Uh, Hundreds of years ago, when somebody was rich, he grabbed the lack, uh, lack of a pig or, uh, I don't know, uh, 
a lamp or something and bottle in the other hand. Ah, I'm so rich, I'm holding everything, you know. My sensory input is overflowing of my success. Now, they're eating ecological, biological sprouts or something like this. To be rich and to eat like this, what the hell, you know. And we are in Getters Town, and in Faust he said, to, to be rich and feeling unsatisfied at the same time is the worst that can happen to you. So please, if you are rich, you don't need another billion. You just need something to grab on, really. <laughs> I grab my microphone now. Thank you so okay, much, Michel. <laughs> So this was very clearly the anthropologist of daily life. I told you that's the reason you're here. Thank you so much for that. Actually, Wolfgang, that reminded me a bit of your wooden chest. So you're holding your wooden chest and you're thinking back of your family and touch it and feel. Is that possible? Uh, I, 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 yes, I, I do that. I do that. Um, um, I also listen to it. I listen to the sound of opening the box and closing the box. What about, actually, what I do mostly is I smell on it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The smell is a very intense uh, sense, and it's really, it really for me, what, what that box mostly means is, is the smell. Mm -hmm. the smell what the what Misha mentioned with his... Uh his Langspielplatte, his record, is actually something very no noticeable even in the States. You go to a music shop and you have a great revival of vinyl records. So would you say, Wolfgang, that this is a general trend? We have intensified digitization, all these somewhat boring, non-haptic products, and at the same time we have a re revival of grandpa's wooden chests vinyl records and other stuff? Is that a trend? I would, I would certainly agree with uh, Wolfgang Welsch, uh, the German philosopher who in the 90s, in his theory of postmodernity, already stated that this is a dual development. We have on the one hand a development towards virtualization and dematerialization, and on the other hand a return of old objects that are haptic objects, objects that you can touch with your hands, that, you know, that, where, mm -hmm. where, where that kind of hand feeling comes back. He always said that that was going to happen 10 years before the internet took off. Now with the internet, I think we have with, with, with digital media, we're seeing a lot more of that. My wooden box, your vinyl, seed, mm -hmm. uh, your vinyl um, um, records, um, and so on. But of course, both the box and the records now have a different meaning than they had when they were first created. They have a different meaning, they have an aestheticized meaning, they have perhaps the, the, um, the function or the pleasure that we take from them is that they remind us of our own integrity, of our own physical mental integrity and they keep us from hallucinating. That's a good point. Um, I just wonder what did you bring to us? Any records or walking sticks? Or? Uh, It's your five minutes and... None of that sort, just a few uh, d d digital notes <laughs> I, 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 I brought. But um, I'm hesitant to bring them up because, because your statement has given me so much food for thought. It reminded me of my, my students when they write their, their essays and they keep one of their most cherished platitudes that I'm trying to disabuse them of is to write... Um, we have all this information at our fingertips. Exactly, yeah, yeah. Not in our hand, yeah. but at our fingertips. Um, it is a platitude to, 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 to say that, and, and um, I'm glad you provided me with a story I can tell them now. Thank you. So, <laughs> <laughs> why to avoid the platitude of having everything at your fingertips? Um, the other thing that came to my mind is, even though this is true, um, what you say about um, the loss of um, interaction with our hands and palms, um, we still talk about handhelds, and it see, still seems that our digital gadgets, as we use them, have like as a minimum size, the size of our hands, so we can hold them in our hands, and um, we'll see whether that stays that way. I mean. It won't, probably. I don't think so. It won't, probably. But, or I, I don't know. I mean, 
I mean, there are some uh, areas of life where we, we fight against modernity and we don't let go. We want to keep our hands full. One is the American Rifle Association with this logo, uh, out of my dead hands you will take this gun or something. <laughs> you know? And the uh, second one is that during, um, uh, in just this, in this century, the breast implant uh, operation has risen three, tripled, you know. Sorry. We guess we know <laughs> what you mean. Yeah, I know. Uh, Wolf, did you finish your five minutes yet? No, I don't know. So. I think so. Okay. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm, too late. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's yeah. fine. That's fine. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very intrigued by what um, my colleague was saying. Um, in a sense, perhaps um, the idea about ownership, which is our, which is our subject, can be explained also along the lines that you've you've presented. Um, in the old way, something that we were owning is something that we could hold, or as we still say, we lay our hands on it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We put our hands on it, means we own it, we, we, we possess it, it's, it's ours. And I think one of the things that's, that's, that's happening, um, that has been happening in, um, in the field of digital media, is that once, um, once something, once an, once an object is present in a digital file, it loses its originality and it, you, we lose the possibility to, to interact with it as something that we can possess. Um, it becomes more and more difficult um, to have, in the literal sense of the word, to have a digital object. The digital object, once it's born, once it's there, the digital file is endlessly copyable and therefore potentially everybody's and not just mine. Um, and I think what we're seeing is once the, once the CD, the audio CD that you showed us, went out, left the market, um, more and more we are we're looking at business models, at understandings of ownership that had, have less to do with having and more to do with being, with who you are. Uh, the example would be uh, the subscription model, models that keep proliferating. Netflix, for example, doesn't offer you to buy, to download, like iTunes still does it. You can actually download a file which you then have on your computer. But Netflix asks you something else. Netflix asks you, who are you? So you open the Netflix start page and it asks me, are you Wolfgang or are you somebody else? If I tell them I'm Wolfgang, I click a box that says Wolfgang, then Netflix has identified me as who I am and who I am gives me access. And that what remains of ownership in the digital age. Um, and um, so since this conference is about sharing, I suggest that there is a reason why sharing is constantly confused with exchange. And that is both uh, modalities of being. When I say I share something, it means I am with another person. That's what happens when I share. Therefore, the sense of commonality, sometimes the sense of intimacy that arises out of an act of a situation of sharing. The very fact that we share, the air that we breathe in here, the light that streams in here, the facilities we have here, establishes us as a, as a community. It gives us that specific form of, that specific modality of being. And What's so interesting to see in the digital industry, in the media industry nowadays, is how they exploit that possibility of commonality that comes out of sharing towards a very successful, globally spreading business model. And that, those are the questions I ask myself. It's not a question, it's an observation, but I'm offering it. Well, let's go back to owning. If I take these wonderful records over there, owning in previous times have, has always been a method for a definition of myself. 
I own this old VW, 50 years old, and wherever I drive through Turingen, every, kids are waving at me, and I really like that. It's, it's a matter to slow down. I've got my books at home, so if my friend Klaus comes over to visit, he knows, ah, oh, well, he's a well-read man, my colleague, and it defines my personality. So in our digital world, when I don't own all these things anymore, are there no more symbols of statues or have they all disappeared or what is a new symbol of my value in society i think uh, um, he was right i mean uh, it's um, from owning it has moved to status i mean if i'm subscribed to this and this and this to everything you know that my status is higher than somebody that's not uh, doesn't have access to this and this and this so our status is now measured by uh, access to information basically you know but um, buying uh, consumerism is uh, i think it's uh, uh, we we need a proof that we exist and uh, buying all the time is uh, proving ourselves that we are still functioning existing that we are still accepting uh, accepted as a part of society you know because uh, uh, I mean, I'm just uh, preparing to, uh, 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 for a, a feature film about the uh, erased people of Slovenia. And so, imagine that suddenly all your documents, uh, credit cards, bank cards, every card you have would be invalid now, at this moment. You don't exist actually anymore. Um, answering to your question, when you say, um, my possessions, like my car and my house, um, and so on, um, what I have defines me, then, then you would be talking about what Erich Fromm in the 1960s called um, the mode of having. So the having defines your being. And um, I think what we're seeing in the digital world um, is a kind of disappearance of having, but that does not mean that there are no hierarchies and no, and no um, orders of, of, of status. I think perhaps more than having access to subscriptions and information, um, that is done through the social media and through the rankings that exist. So as you run social media, and in fact, on most of, most of the Web 2.0 media that, that allow users to interact with, with the platform, upload their own content, you will find rating mechanisms, you will find star mechanisms, give so many stars to the hotel you're staying in, you, you will be able to comment, um, you will be able to share through other social media the ratings that you have assigned, there'll be a Facebook thumb on pretty much every Web 2.0 page nowadays. Now, all of this combines into a process of symbolic exchange, which even in the digital world, as it did it previously in the non-digital world, establishes, defines social hierarchies. If you are, get positive reviews, you get all these stars, you get all these likes, you get all these retweets, you get all of those positive responses in the social media world, that will make you somebody who counts yes. in the digital world, whether you own a house and a BMW or not. Those kinds of things in that situation don't come in anymore, which is why some people would, you know, would see the internet and especially the web as something inherently liberating. Mm -hmm. But the insidious and tricky thing here, I think, to observe is that while you can get rid of your possessions and reduce them to a wooden box or <coughs> two vinyl records or whatever you want to, you, you know, you want you want to keep clothes that you're wearing. Um, you're no longer free in the same sense that you kind of lose your sovereignty as a subject because in the digital world, especially in the social media world, you are how others define you, how others like you, how others retweet you, how many stars you get from others, right? That's what you are. And you will find yourself adjusting, adapting to those kinds of mechanisms. In other words, I had a discussion earlier today with somebody who said, well, why am I never posting anything negative on Facebook? Why am I not posting on Facebook? Man, I'm sick, I just lost my job, 
I just sent the 45th application that was ignored. Um, I totally suck. Why am I not posting that? Yeah. It's because it doesn't bring me any kind of any kind of positive feedback, any kind of positive ratings, any kind of retweets, reposts, etc., etc. None of these things. So I have lost any kind of sovereignty that I may have had. Now I can already hear myself objecting to my own statement and saying, "Okay, if that's the case." Previously, I didn't have much of the sovereignty either because I was defined through what I would have, was having. And all this, or not having. I have these students that um, many of them come from China. They drive huge BMW X6 at the age of 19. Um, there's plenty of space in Ohio. There's, place, there's plenty of space there, but it's an example of how that kind of, that kind of having mode is still valued as something that gives you status, that gives you, that, that, that gives you that kind of social status. But that would also be a non-sovereign way of being. Yeah? So that is the problem. We have either that choice, or if we look at being in, in the world of Web 2.0 and, and, and on the digital media, we will find that our being is defined by others and by how we interact with others and that all of those interactions lead to a process of symbolic exchange that defines who we are and that may change between today and tomorrow. Uh, I mean, that was beautiful said by the philosopher. philosopher. Can I try it again to say the same thing as a writer? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, I think it was two years ago, I was rereading uh, Franz Kafka, uh, The um, Transformation. What's the German title? Verwandt, yeah. And um, it's, a, you know the story, of course. It's a story, a man who's not allowed by, allowed by his family, not accepted in, at his uh, office work and so on. And, but genius of Kafka uh, was that he turned this man into the vermin, you know, literally. Okay. And everybody's happy when he's dead and so on. So I was rereading this, and I started thinking, if Kafka would write this today, what would this metamorphosis be? And I didn't get the idea for two years, but just <laughs> last week, suddenly, <gasps> yes. So I wrote a story about a woman who uh, wakes up and uh, starts her day with a daily ritual by posting some selfies on the Facebook. And if he gets to her job, Nobody has liked the posts, you know. Nobody has commented how beautiful you are today, you know. Something is wrong. So she d does it again and again, and by noon, she's feeling worse than Gregor Samsa because she's ignored totally on Facebook. She's vermin. I mean, that is status and acceptance in the eyes of the others 100 years later. I think so. I don't know. Since you mentioned Erich Fromm, I just wonder if the selfie isn't the perfect synthesis of having and being. It's not very heavy, it's, but still it's kind of people run around and they, they, they still want to possess, don't they? They want to possess the moment, me standing in front of Goethe's garden house here in the park. Of course I did it. Well, maybe the selfie as I see it, the selfie is, is, is an attempt to reclaim um, lost sovereignty as, 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 as a subject, as myself, because uh, through the selfie, more than anything else, I can create the illusion that I am sure of myself, I am sure who I am, and I can look at it right here, yeah? in, 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 in just an instant. Um, somebody else taking my photograph is not the same thing. Somebody else making my photograph makes an author's decision on how he or she wants okay. to photograph me. I may not look the way I want to look, the way I want to see myself on that photograph. The selfie eliminates <laughs> all of that uncertainty. So therefore the selfie, in a, in a situation where being, your own being, is constantly being refined, it's a constant flux over which you have no real authority anymore, that gives you a kind of certainty that is very attractive. Therefore, all of the selfies 
you upload them on social media, people like them, you get the illusion for mm -hmm. as long as it lasts until the attention migrates somewhere else. You get the illusion, I am who I am. I am the master of my own self. The situation that you have described, that process fails. Yes. Right? Yeah. But this is the age of individualism, so you have to do it yourself, <laughs> self it too. But you know, uh, I started as a computer expert, and the computers that are um, in, the, in the network are uh, sending, even if they are not like uh, tra uh, transferring some data, they are sending uh, occasional um, signals uh, called pings. And this pinging means just this, I'm alive, I'm alive, I'm still working, you know, I'm alive. And you have this thousand, thousand, millions and billions of computers just pinging, I'm alive, I'm alive, I'm alive. And sending selfies on Instagram, Facebook, is this, I'm alive, I'm alive, I'm alive, you know, for me. Let's change the subject, selfies are just two. Um, if you read German newspapers, international newspapers, even Americans, you have long articles by writers who who explain how they got rid of their well-beloved library, for example, which was a real, I mean, the books and us was a union. And others regularly describe how they got rid of their cars. So the question to our two guests, are things really disappearing? And when we think back of Jeremy Rifkin's sermon at the beginning of this conference, can we be optimistic that all that useless stuff at the U-Haul depots in the States, as they're all going to disappear and we're going to have a better, ecologically correct, sunshine world tomorrow. Um, you go first. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, the anthropologist's view. Okay, uh, when we, <laughs> so, um, when, I, uh, when I buy a gramophone record or CD or book, I get uh, more sensory information that I want. I get the smell, the touch, the taste. The taste, even that. I can everything. Uh, or when I uh, meet, if I, I don't know, chat or make virtual sex or something, this, uh, I don't get as much information with, and when, when meeting somebody in person. Because uh, you, you should know that, that uh, reason is just a small part of the brain just small part, relatively new part of the brain. So I think, now I can't remember the exact number, but I think that on our sensory input is like 10 billions of bits of information, you know, per second. While our reason can process 150 bits or something. So there's a big, giant world coming to our senses, going unprocessed by reason, but it is processed by other parts of our brain. And, uh, you know, there's, there's, and there, <laughs> the other thing is we are, uh, that our reason has half of a second delay, but for, uh, is behind, is lagging behind our, our other parts of the brain, you know. And when, when we see somebody for the first time, we see him with our snake brain or whatever you want to call it, you know. And then after f half of the second, you know, reason comes in. And there's a lot of, lot of information going through some conscience, and we, we have this uh, uh, picture, I mean, oh, pictures of the world which are, I mean, uh, uh, are very, uh, reason, uh, what is information uh, made by the reason is very poor, poor substitute for our, whatever we can do in our subconscious on symbolic level, whatever we can do. But uh, so uh, the world of, poor, uh, of pure information, of pure reason is a very poor world, actually. We are missing a lot. I mean, uh, we are exchanging all of these micro informations all of the time when we are talking to somebody. We even uh, uh, hold uh, DNK of our, all of our ex-lovers in our body because we are exchanging this DNK while we are kissing, making love, and so on. I mean, there's a lot of exchange of all kind of information going on all, uh, on all the time in physical contact when you are talking to somebody or whatever. And this is a 
poor substitute, substitute that uh, think, uh, uh, because it gives us the illusion of immortality. We will download our brain to the computer. Maybe, but we will download those 150 bits per second. And billions of billions we create, we get every second, will get lost. I, I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's true. true. It's no, true. I was, I was just thinking that what a pity Nietzsche is no longer alive. He died in I'm this sure very he's somewhere in, in, this, in this very town and and was uh, rejected by the um, Eastern German authorities as being irrational and not giving enough power to reason and and our possibility. Um, of, of reasoning, I think most psychologists nowadays would, would agree with what you say in the sense that, that um, a lot of our motivation, a lot of the, the, the ways in which we justify our actions towards us have little to do with reason. And I think, uh, again, if we look at Web2 and, and um, user-based uh, digital media, you will find an enormous appeal, an enormous trend towards expressing your emotions, um, your inclinations, your desires, your, your, your whatever is emotional and somehow, and somehow positive, because that's what a social medium can transform into a market value. Now, if you have, if you express positive things all the time, like, I like this, I like this, I like this, I like this, then that is information that the advertisement industry can be fed. If you say, you know, what the hell, it doesn't mean anything. So there's no information, there's no sales value. Um, but um, maybe I, you know, I, um, um, I've lost, I've lost track. I'm sorry. It's the last uh, session. Uh, it's no it's problem. I have, a, uh, I have an excuse. I mean, uh, the, the gramophone record over there is full of good tracks. <laughs> we'll bring one in. Come on, don't worry. <laughs> yes, to talk about Jeremy, um, Jeremy Rifkin and, and that smooth transition that he, that he envisioned um, has to be fast, but according to him, it's going to be smooth and, and um, nobody's going to resist it. Um, uh, I don't know. I, I don't know where to begin. I think we should have had a panel discussion with Jeremy Rifkin on one hand mm. and one of Germany's foremost pessimists, mm. uh, Byun Jul Han, on the other on the other side, because uh, what Byun Jul Han will tell you is that all of this is part of a transition in a global digitized culture where any kind of negativity, any kind of resistance is obliterated and no longer part of our consideration. I think that is what's happening to, 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 to Rifkin's perspective. And that's why it feels so good to listen to it. And that's why mm -hmm. he's such a good keynote speaker and a speaker at corporate congresses and so on, mm -hmm. where people want to feel smart and good at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, it's a perfect blend. But I think it, it, it is also a way of kind of um, concealing the negativity that exists in our culture and societies mm. and that has to exist in order for there to be any kind of critical engagement, any kind of, any kind of real political discourse. If we're just limiting ourselves to a Facebook discourse of like, 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 we'll in the end be once again be hallucinating. Mm. Um, uh, so, so I think there is um, there is um, um, probably for me less less reason for for pessimism for for, for optimism than for Rifkin. Um, I, I'm also much poorer than he is, so I, <laughs> I, I, I just see the world from a different place. Um, so interesting. I mean, his his model of ownership for the future is a sharing model. And we don't own anything anymore, we just, we just share everything. And I think it, it, it leaves out what is my main concern, and that is that you don't have to rule people through ownership anymore, through the process of having, through the process of redistributing goods, like in the, like in, in, in the previous model. But 
people kind of rule themselves through the process of mm. subjectivation they're constantly engaged in, the, so the process of self-promotion. You look at your mobile phone and it's full of little apps that are designed around that very process and that tempt you and seduce you to engage in that mm. on a permanent kind of basis. I have on my phone a, an app that's a little hard. It's the fitness app. Mm. Right, so that app encourages me to monitor my my mm. my fitness levels, and then once I do that, it, it it encourages me to share them with others, so I can enter into competition with others, mm. and I can feel bad about myself, and I can download a motivational quote that mm. makes me mm. do things. Right, so. I tried to eliminate that silly app from my phone. And you know what? You've got a mirror you in can. your bathroom. I can't. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, uh, I cannot eliminate that yeah. app. But interestingly, there's another app I cannot eliminate. And that's the stock exchange app. <laughs> yeah. I've also tried to eliminate that. So my thesis is the two things are connected. Not uh, just on the phone, but <laughs> conceptually connected. You do become rich uh, when you uh, look at it. I mean, uh, yeah, I remember now, uh, there was uh, a letter exchanged by, uh, uh, by uh, with John or um, George Orwell after uh, publishing 1984 and Aldous Huxley after Brave New World, you know. And uh, I think the Huxley said, uh, said I mean, uh, your 1984 reads better now with Soviet Union and these uh, things going on. But I do think, he said, um, that they will uh, find some softer, softer way to rule, you know, not drugs probably, but something softer. And I'm old enough to remember these American films from the 1970s where uh, uh, government was enslaving people by, uh, by giving them uh, some uh, gadget to wear, you know, with chains uh, and so on, you know. Uh, and the funny thing is that after 30, 30 years later, you know, people are paying, I don't know, 700 euros to wear something that monitors them constantly, you know. So uh, in a way it's... Uh, but it's, uh, it's very soft, and you want to be a part of it, actually. It feel, because you are part of it. And that's... Uh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm not part of it. I am it. Yeah, okay, yeah. You're right, yes. I am it. That, that, that is who I am. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. And because I cannot eliminate you the can't. fitness app, and I can't eliminate the stock exchange app, much as it bother me every day, I have, it, it just, and I mean that literally, it just means I cannot, I have no full sovereignty over myself. I mean, uh, you, of course you can't, uh, uh, you can't remove your fitness app because not maybe this year, but next year or in two years, uh, when you will be paying your health insurance or something, they will want to see this data, how you live, of course. You can't be insured without this, that's normal, I mean. So we can quote for the protocol yeah. that I have still have my chairs and tables and you have your apps you can get rid of. One last question to ownership before we open to the public. Um, whenever you walk through a town like Weimar, Tel Aviv, Christchurch, Pittsburgh, you find these kind of fashionable little spots where you can get a book and you are asked to leave a book. So these are really trendy lifestyle book exchange places and people love them and my question is why at the same time is a wonderful institution like a library where you can get exactly the book you want for free more or less why are they more or less dying out even if they try to reinvent themselves as digital whatsoever centers they are slowly dying out in an age of sharing so why is that <laughs> My library is dying out in an age of sharing. Um, I, I don't know they are. Are they? I mean, you, you know more about it being... being um, Not in the days. States. Somehow they, they managed to get the transition. Yes. Um, 
But it would be, it would be if, if that were actually the case, it would be a, a huge contradiction because, because libraries are institutions of sharing. That's what we do with libraries. That's where we, you know, we mm -hmm. share things. Mm -hmm. The libraries are really a commons, mm -hmm. a knowledge commons where you pick out your books. Um, I wish I had a good answer for your question. You know, where, 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 does, where does that making books available for free, where does, where does that come from? I've observed it myself. Um, and uh, uh, in a sense, I think there is, there is a sense of, of attachment, of nostalgic attachment to the book as a physical object that, that people have, and that, 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 seems to be, that seems to be part of the explanation, perhaps, because, of course, you can download the books on, on, on your Kindle mm -hmm. and, and walk around with, it, with yet another electronic gadget, but what, uh, what I have found is that <laughs> there's something deeply unsatisfactory about electronic things, and that is they smell bad. <laughs> um, or they don't smell at all. And I'm not, I'm not joking about this. This is something you watch people in a library, you watch people in a bookshop, they take the book, they feel the book, they smell the book. Mm -hmm. And I, I ask my students, do you do that? Yes. Why do you do it? We have no explanation. We, we just do it and it doesn't work with a Kindle. So there is something that a book does, just like you said about the vinyl record. Something that a book does that the Kindle doesn't do. And, and um, maybe those little book exchange places or book sharing places that people spontaneously create are simply a sign of people caring for their environment. It comes, an environment understood not just as a natural environment, but as your knowledge environment, as your cultural environment. That would be my guess. I mean, as a writer, uh, the, problem, <laughs> the problem with a book as a content is, uh, I mean, if you, uh, if you go and, uh, and see uh, data about uh, the use of television going up, the use of uh, listening to the music going up, the use of radio going up, everything is going up. But the day is still 24 hours long and we sleep in a job. And why? Because, and the internet going up. Why? Because you come home, for instance, you turn on TV, you turn on radio, you turn on your uh, Spotify player, you turn on everything you turn on. So, <laughs> but you can you can be focused on only one thing. But if you open the book, you just open the book. <laughs> it has nothing. Books cannot be in the background. You have to focus on them, you know. And there is something because. Uh, when uh, uh, returning back to holding the book or the gramophone record, when we, how do we know that something is real and it's not the imagination, uh, uh, the uh, phantom, if it fills our senses, senses plural, and if we are just getting, I don't know, something through our eyes, but not uh, uh, taste, uh, smell it, taste it, or touch it, it has this sense of unreality, and our lower parts of the brain think, okay, this must not be very interesting because it's not real. And I will tell you something. I mean, I, had, I have a chance in Slovenia to go to the largest portals, and uh, news portals, and check, uh, check there how people are reading, you know. You can check there by paragraphs how people are reading. Okay, you will say now that might be for Slovenes only, but I assure you that, uh, that I mean, I think if 4% of the readers comes to the last paragraph, that's extremely good. Less than half of them even doesn't scroll down one page, you know. And uh, official YouTube statistics, uh, more than 50% of people stops watching the video after the first minute, you know, something. And uh, there was leaked information uh, from uh, Amazon, how many people have stopped reading Thomas Piketty, The Capital in 21st Century. You know that one? 
I think it was 3%, uh, after 3% of the pages, you know, never to return. So, uh, I mean, <laughs> if it, you cannot smell it, touch it, it is not a, the object, it has this sense of unreality, and it's not, just not interesting, and that's a problem, you know, because if you want to present somebody with a long, uh, uh, no, uh, not Twitter-like argument, you know, something long that needs to be read very carefully, it helps a lot if you can hold this in your hands. And people are actually printing out this kind of electronic stuff to hold in their hands, you know, to touch it, to feel real. Now this is important because it feels real. That's why the paperless office has yeah. never been, <laughs> never never been, been achieved. Yes, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> well, I have something in my hand, and that's my, my iPhone with the watch. It's up to you. Any questions to our two wonderful guests yet? It's the good old ladies first, and then we say two, three. Uh, hello. Thank you for the um, conversation. Uh, I'm Tina Hens. I'm a journalist from Belgium, and I have... Three little remarks, not really a question, just something that I wanted to add, uh, share. Huh? Um, first, on the libraries, why, why they are closing, it's a simple answer. Um, in my country, they aren't closing, but it's seen as a public service. And in countries where uh, the public or the authority or the government is retreating um, and giving everything to the market, libraries are closing down. It seems to me a very simple uh, answer. And then I, something that I uh, wanted to add was, um, if you look at uh, Facebook and how it is used, uh, there's a big difference, um, a social difference. Um, like middle class users um, start using it for commenting on society, and Facebook even said that that was a problem because we, are, uh, we aren't yeah, hang, um, looking for attention anymore, but we are really talking about what is happening around this. Um, but a study revealed that um, lower income classes do use it as something like their social life. So the digi digital gap that Facebook is producing is not so much like people who don't have internet or do have internet, but people who have a real social life and people who have a virtual social life. That was something I want. And then another thing I wanted to add was, I don't think Rifkin is telling us that we have to share everything, but I think it's more about that uh, the stuff we use is differently produced, and it's about sustainable production, and not so much about sharing everything. Thank you. Thank you. This Thank you. Valuable. We have the gentleman over there. Thank you for the discussion. Um, anthropologist from uh, um, Carnegie Mellon, uh, his name is Will, William Ad Odom, uh, he um, introduced the term virtual possessions. Uh, so people keep acquiring virtual possessions in, in different forms uh, today. Uh, for example, in the form of the, our uh, archives of pictures or files or documents in our computer in, in the cloud, also in form of um, more emergent digital content, for example, our um, preferences and tastes uh, post on the, uh, on the social networks or biometrical data in your app with the heart. Uh, so uh, physical possessions in the world of uh, Internet of Things will obviously also have a, their counterpart in the digital world, a so-called doppelganger so to say. So my question is, and I'm surprised it didn't come out uh, from the discussion, is that what would be your opinion on the privacy challenges of our virtual possessions? The real challenge is having a short answer to that. Who's first this um, I can uh, be very brief about that, I think. The uh, of, privacy, yeah. The, the question of privacy is um, an example of how I, um, I, I tried to say before, that, um, that our social hierarchies um, are more defined through being than through having in the digital world. So the question of privacy touches exactly on who you are and who knows about who you are and what you are. So 
that is the reason why privacy for the digital economy, for the digital industry is a real obstacle. It, it, just, it just stands in the way of its own modus operandi. And, and um, if, you know, that's why many online sites have privacy statements that nobody understands and nobody reads because they don't really want you to know about it. It's not an optimistic point of view, but I think that, that we are looking at that right here. Uh, I mean, privacy is relatively new invention. It started in 18th century, became uh, more, uh, <laughs> more widespread in 19th century, and now it's going out. I think it's over, yes. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, it was a blip in the history. If you read the uh, manuscript of Montalou, that was the French village that, I don't know, 15th, 16th century, the Inquisition took everybody. And they were just, you know, like, we, know, we want to know everything. And there's no concept of privacy. Everybody know, knew everybody, who's this woman, who was last night. Everybody, small village, everybody knows everybody. Everything. No secrets. And uh, then the concept of privacy, because you need your own room for the privacy. I mean, and uh, society has to got uh, enough money and wealth for people to have the middle classes even to have their own rooms and so on. And uh, now, uh, uh, because we are all attached to the gadget, it's gone. I mean, it's gone. You, you cannot keep them. I mean, you can keep it like legally. Oh, we are guaranteeing you privacy. But when the Hitler took uh, power in 1933, the first law they changed was the uh, law about letters and post offices, you know? And it says suddenly we can read everything, <laughs> you know? Can so I just say I need to add one sentence to this <laughs> yeah, because you, you 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 brought up a point I think that's important with the question concerning privacy, and that is um, I think loss of privacy invasion of privacy are real losses they're real political yes. losses which is why uh, dictatorships usually don't have privacy assurances and um, why in a democracy we vote in tiny little booths hiding mm. away from everybody else. Mm. Now this is where we exercise our privacy. It's a very, at the very core of a liberal democracy. Now you could argue that liberal democracies are on the way out and therefore privacy goes with it. Maybe this is happening, but I don't think right now we have a better model. Agree. Last question. Gentlemen. Yes, very briefly. Um, one important kind of possession that Rifkin also skipped over, which is real estate. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, I mean, what happens to real estate in this modern uh, digital economy? Because surely if we all live in Airbnb flats, whose Airbnb flats do we live in? Spaces, I mean, there's more and more people moving to cities and spaces not, you can't just produce it cheaply like that. Uh, real, uh, real estate will be harder to kill because if privacy is, uh, concept of privacy is 200 years old, uh, concept of real estate is, I don't know, 10,000 years old uh, when people start planting something, you know, and this is my land, this is my land up here. So that will be hard, <laughs> probably, yes. I agree. I mean, I had a lot of que question to while reading Griffkin's book. <laughs> Hmm. I would love to have an extra panel tomorrow morning, maybe at 7, on that subject alone, because it's yeah, really yeah. essential. I mean, I live in Boston paying $5,000 for a ridiculously yeah. small apartment, and I'm very much afraid other parts of the world are going again to follow the United States, and I do hope Ohio is a bit cheaper than Boston. Um, <laughs> which is the positive note we are going to end this wonderful panel on. Thank you so much for coming. It's been a tremendous pleasure. Uh, last confession, I was really looking forward to the two of you and you were a lot better than I expected, even. But we didn't so quarrel. So we didn't quarrel no, a lot. At all. Yeah. Thanks for coming. <laughs> thanks for staying faithful to us. Go all to the big final tonight and have a great weekend. Thanks. Thank you.